We spend a third of our lives doing it, or at least we should, and while it's very pleasant, we often resist it. That's sleep, a commodity that's in short supply in the modern age. It's been called beauty sleep because it regulates hormones, slows aging, controls appetite, reduces heart disease, depression, and diabetes. With our fast-paced lives, we sleep 90 minutes less than our forebears. But what's more important, the quality of our sleep or the quantity? And can you get too much? Stand by, Go Healthy For Good starts right now. Hello and welcome to Go Healthy for Good. If you're a regular viewer of Go Healthy, you will be familiar with Sean Chevalier, our personal trainer and fitness coach. Sean runs a boot camp called Hard Body Outdoor Fitness. That's where today's story comes from. Meet Sergio. So, like I said, five years ago, before that, you know, lifestyle was work and eat. <laughs> um, just, and I still eat. I mean, I say I'm not a, I'm not your regular athlete as you can see I mean I'm still a big guy but I enjoy food too much. Triathlon community is what helped me start getting in shape and you know losing weight but you know eating healthier so I went from you know I'm, it, it's been a yo-yo for me like up and down uh, um, you know try every diet possible you know all the I you know the no bread no pasta no carbs I mean I've done all of them and Never, you know, y'all lose weight fast and then winter comes and gain it back up. So that's when I met Sean, it's been about three years. And what he helped me was find, finding the balance in life. You know, I used to be, when I first got into like triathlon, I did it for my son so I can exercise with him and do races. So I was like all in and then, you know, she's never, got burned out and left it. So when I started doing hard body with Sean, it was more of a finding a balance in life. You know, my son did, he's disabled. You know, he has several palsy, so he's in a wheelchair. Um, and my wife started joined first with athletes serving athletes. And that's how I wanted to be involved as well. So I started exercising, you know, doing the, because I like biking, I like swimming not so much running, so I wanted something that, so as I started losing weight, I was able to do some runs. And I started doing triathlons, like little ones, you know, a sprint, and from the sprint triathlons, just short distance, you know, it's like 500 meter swim, 10 mile bike ride, and, and, a, and a 5K. And then I went to do an Olympic, and then I did a half Ironman. And like three years ago, four years ago, I decided I want to do a full Ironman, which is 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and a full marathon. And that first one, I was still, I went all crazy training, and that was when like the balance tipped off of too much exercise and not enough time with the family. So I did it, and you know, it wasn't a balance. So then I backed off and just start doing more just with like with Sean and then I did another Ironman, took a year off and this year I did a, another one, my third one. On today's show we have a sleep guru, lots of advice on getting our 40 winks, a workout with Sean and the rest of Sergio's story. But first up, the news. In the headlines today, TVs don't work well in bedrooms, more media, less insomnia, and night owls live shorter lives. Having a TV or video game in the bedroom creates problems for kids, according to an Iowa State University study. Researchers tracked children for one to two years and found those with a TV or video game in their bedroom were more likely to be obese, addicted to video games, physically aggressive, and to do less well at school. Parents, 
the average child is now getting over eight hours of screen time a day, so restrictions are in your child's best interest. In the words of the lead researcher, who is also a parent, it's easier to never allow a TV in the bedroom than it is to take it out. Increasing use of electronics results in increasing rates of insomnia and depression in adolescents. 3,000 young people were asked about sleep, symptoms of depression, and the number of hours they used screens. Researchers found a link between insomnia and shorter sleep duration and extended periods of social messaging, web surfing, and TV and movie watching. Gaming had a stronger relationship to depression. These findings are consistent with an Australian study of adolescents that found shorter sleep duration lowers happiness. And poor quality sleep increases negative emotions like anger, fear, and anxiety. So young people, bear in mind that screen time does not equate to happiness. Morning people live longer than night owls. It's known that evening preference and going to bed later is associated with more disease, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. But we didn't know about death rates until this new study of 430,000 people enrolled in the UK Biobank study. They completed a questionnaire that classified them into four groups based on morning or evening preference. Researchers found that compared to morning people, night owls were 94% more likely to have psychological issues, 30% more likely to have diabetes, and 25% more likely to have respiratory, neurological, and GI disorders. They had a 10% increased risk of death during the six-year study. So I guess that settles it. Early to bed, early to rise truly makes us healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'm Dr. Nerida McKibben, and that's today's health news. Today's guest is Dr. Param Didia, Director of Sleep Medicine at Canyon Ranch in Tucson, Arizona, which is where we went to meet him, at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine meeting. I asked him how much sleep we all need from the youngest to the oldest. It's always the great question, right? And also the conversation, it does vary over time. Children, you know, what do they need? 17 plus hours of sleep. Teenagers need nine or more hours of sleep. And us as adults, the National Sleep Foundation says we need seven to nine, and after age 65, they're starting to focus on seven to eight as really being healthy. So, you know, the conversation again, it varies through the ages. A lot of people think we need less sleep as we get older. The truth of the matter is, is right after age 18, it's fairly stable. But the real concern is, as we get older, there's this conversation as such. We get less sleep, but we still need it. So we need less compared to when we were younger. But so many people say, oh, I'm getting older, I don't need as much sleep. So year after year, decade after decade, if it goes down, they don't pay attention to it. And that's a huge concern of the conversation of enough sleep time. Our teenagers are not getting enough sleep, right? This is a huge conversation. Teenagers of every era have been the rock stars of sleep. And unfortunately now, this teenage career that we're seeing come through are really being challenged. And unfortunately, we're asking high schools to be started later because we finally understand the data. But now they're staying up late, a greater number of exams, greater number of demands, and unfortunately, they are just not getting it. Wow, and that's going to impact their brain, their learning, and all of those things. Well, talk about the stages of sleep and, yeah. and what happens during those stages. It's fascinating, right? The, the old books I have, and I love collecting old books, talk about sleep as being a passive, dormant time in our lives. Once all of a sudden we found the electricity of the brain back around the turn of the last century, all of a sudden now we can start appreciating. There is awake, right? So we don't take people out of their home bedrooms and bring them into our lab. So they come in awake. So we know what the wake brain looks like. There's light sleep, deep sleep, and that fascinating topic called dream sleep. Many people will call it stage one, stage two, stage three. So simplicity, stage one and two is light, Deep sleep is stage three. Rapid eye movement is that of our dreams. And what you would want to know is the reason why I love pointing that out is if you and I first heard light sleep, it doesn't sound very important at all. It's just light sleep. I'm a light sleeper. So we associate this in, a, in an incorrect way. What I would want us to appreciate is about half of our night, roughly up to 60%, is light sleep. It does a lot of garden variety, beautiful things for ourselves. This research is just now starting to unveil. But the real yummy stuff, the stuff that we definitely want to hold on to is that of our deep sleep and that of our dream sleep. Because as you and I get older, those tend to go down. 
Deep sleep and dream sleep is the recovery sleep, the sleep that we definitely need to be able to honor ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally for the lives we want to be a part of. And using sleep to achieve that life. More from Dr. Param in the next segment, though we'll finish with this. Morning, honey. How did you sleep? Oh, not very well. I Why made did... a caffeine fix. Didn't those sleeping pills work? Oh, not at all. I had this vivid dream that really scared me. Scared you? Yes, this voice kept shouting at me, someone's trying to kill you, someone's trying to kill you. Oh. Who could be trying to kill you? I don't know, but I don't have time to think about it right now. Oh, really? Well, what time are you heading out to work? Oh, hang on. Hey, yes, he, is he's, that my boss? He's just no. here. Just a don't moment. Tell, tell him I'm not here. You have to take it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 20 minutes. Yeah, I told you I'll be there in 20 minutes. Okay, okay. All right. Man, I don't know who's trying to kill me, but this stress is just too much for Why, me Why, what have here. you got on today? Oh, I've got those six meetings this afternoon and four deadlines this morning. Oh, and by the way, I won't be home for dinner tonight oh. because I've... Hey, where are my cigarettes oh, and my here, lighter? Here, here, here. Well, what do you mean you're not going to be home? I was go I was going to do steak and eggs for dinner and don't add some worry. nice cheesecake for dessert. Uh, don't worry. What are worry. you going to eat? Oh, I'll go buy big fast food. I'll get a burger and fries and a Coke. And hey, while I'm there, maybe I'll try to figure out who's trying to kill me. But you're so tense. I'm worried. I hate to think what your blood pressure is with all this stress. Ah, uh, don't worry. I'll have my stiff drinks this afternoon. I'll take my antidepressants. And hey, you know what? Those things will probably calm me down enough. I'll be able to try to figure out who's trying to kill me. Oh, you can, I hope you're going to take some sleepers tonight to sleep. I will. OK. Don't live like this or you'll die like this. Doctor's orders. Many of us, when we transition to a plant-based diet, really struggle with the cheese thing, right? But I'll bet Chef Mark Anthony has got that problem next for us today. Yes, I do. I've, I've actually got a lot of cheese, vegan, healthy cheese recipes. And uh, uh, today I'm sharing with you one of my favorites. I love getting people's favorite recipes. Here's what goes in it. Two cups of water, three tablespoons of agar powder, one cup of raw cashews, one tablespoon of lemon juice, one tablespoon of nutritional yeast flakes, one tablespoon of powdered soy milk, one teaspoon of salt, a half teaspoon of onion powder, a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder, one eighth teaspoon of mustard powder, and three tablespoons of fresh dill weed. Mark, what have you got going on over there? Got some water boiling over here, and we're just gonna add three tablespoons of agar agar powder to this and get this baby um, broke down, is what we're doing. So we're gonna let this cook a little bit here and get that baby broke down for us. If you want, this has uh, just a couple more seconds here. It's already breaking down very well. So how do you, uh, what are you looking for as you're boiling that egg egg? Because that's a new, new product for many of us. You're just breaking it down. It's just turning into a... Kind of jelly-like. Yeah, just that's all giving you're doing. It, giving the firmness yeah. to the cheese. Yep. yep. And, and then uh, what you got here is um, we're going to do some blending. Okay. So all the, other ingredients, all the other ingredients go right into the... Um, uh, Vitamix here, the blender. Yep. So we've got lemon juice, we've got our nutritional yeast flakes, uh, mm -mm. our powdered soy milk, salt, garlic and onion. I'm, I'm real big about garlic and onion. Oh yeah, and, you can't uh, go wrong. And mustard is one of those secret ingredients uh, is that for right? this one. Huh. I've actually done this recipe probably seven or eight times before I actually ever uh, Thought got it where I mustard. wanted it. Okay. Yeah, a lot of times I'm doing recipes over and over and over, and then once I get it perfected, then then and we look sticks. at it. Right. Then you put it in one of your lovely books. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> all right. So we're just going to bring this in here, and uh, and then give this a blend. And this is going to take the dill, a little bit. Is, do you keep that for last? Or yeah. Do you put that? Okay. Right at the end, we're going to put okay. that in. Now this is going to take a little work. Um, and yep. then at the last, I'll put the dill in. Right. You can 
tell how creamy it is already. Mm, yeah. Very smooth. And of course, usually I'm scraping down the sides here a little bit. Oh, I can smell it already. So I still want those pieces of dill. For the last blast. Right, because I still mm -hmm. want to have, you know, I don't want it blended too much on the dill part. So we're just going right. to just kind of. Yeah, you don't want to turn it green, pulse right? It. Right. <laughs> And that should do. All right. Now we're going to grab that um, container right there. This one? And, uh, yep. And I'm going to trade right. you with this. All right. And then we're going to put this right in the container here. And, uh, ooh, it's hot. And you can see some big pieces of dill in there. Oh, yeah. Uh, most of it got blended up pretty good. But you don't have to worry about those too big pieces of dill. You can chop it up a little finer if you want. Hey, who, who, who minds having some extra dill? I don't. Yeah. And it really takes a spatula to get in here. Set so that aside for me. Look at it. Then you put that in the fridge, right? Uh-huh. Let me share this with you. <laughs> and when it comes out of the fridge, boom. You that have... is slicing cheese. Right, exactly. Look at this. This is one of those few things that, oh, you should taste it. It's just. Uh, don't worry, I will. There you I go. Will. <laughs> Mind my fingers the right way. Yeah, way. yeah. But it's amazing. It's just like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, now, this is not a melting cheese. Like a lot okay. of cheeses melt. Well, uh, it melted in them. You'd have to use a carrageenan or something like that. But uh, oh, for sliced okay. cold cheeses, mm -hmm. you could cube this into cubes if you wanted. Instead of slices, you would actually take a bigger piece and go like this, and you'd have your cubed. So if you want mm, to throw you know, in a salad right. or a... depending yep. what your presentation is for. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm. Mm, it's all good. Mm, mm -hmm. It is. Sergio and his wife have triplets, one girl and two boys. One of the boys, Gabriel, has cerebral palsy. So his wife and the triplets joined an athletic organization called Athletes Serving Athletes. Sergio was feeling left out though he knew if he was to join them, he would need coaching. So he signed up to Sean's Boot Camp, Hard Body Outdoor Fitness. See what happened next. My heaviest, I was 366 pounds. I mean, in, there's a difference also being a, a big person versus a healthier person. You know, like I said, I'm still, you know, I'm a 300 pound guy, I'm 6'3", but I'm healthy, 300 pounds. I mean, yeah, could I go and keep losing weight? Yes, I wanted to lose weight. But what it triggered was sitting on the sideline, watching, you know, friends and wife doing stuff that I know I can do it. You know, the first time I was going to do an Ironman, my doctor, he's like, you can't do that. No way. I mean, you're going to have a heart attack. I mean, and I'm not going to sign it off. I mean, you got to go do a stress test, you know. So it's like, okay. So I, I went to do those stress tests on the treadmill, and the guy looked at me. He's like, go ahead and run. You know, I was full training. <laughs> he's like. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> um, I don't know how, but you're good. So that's what I said. You can't look from the outside. It's how you feel on the inside. You know, if, you, you know, if you feel strong and you're doing the things that, like I said, I'm doing it just to, you know, to participate. I don't say I don't compete. I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, it's, everything is willpower. Um, it's, I, mean, I have a s strong personality, so once I put my mind to something, I, I do it so I can't compare other people. I mean, it's not easy. I mean, it's hard work, but you have to enjoy it. You have to have fun with it. So that's why the last couple of years is when I really am having fun with it. I mean, I wasn't obsessed with losing weight. Before it was all about, I want to lose weight. And you start doing all these crazy diets and stuff like that. And then as soon as you stop, you gain it back. For me, the, the biggest, the number one thing is be able to be a role model to my kids but also have them included. So doing stuff together means, you know, running, uh, we just did a, just last Sunday, we did a triathlon with my son that's disabled. So, you know, my wife and I did it together as a team. So we swim, we pull him on the boat, and then we bike, pull him in on the trailer, and then we run together. I mean, that's what we did as a, we call it Team Gabriel, because my son is Gabriel. And that stuff, you know, and their brother and sister, they, just both support us, you know, in, in the summertime, they, just them three 
do the triplets do a triathlon together and Gabriel is able to s kind of swim by himself with a, somebody helping and then his brother will pull him on his bike and then his sister will pull him you know push him on the stroller or like jogging it's a little small trap but they do it they want to do it I mean they look forward to stuff like that and it's part of the team like I said it Athlete serve an athlete community. I mean, so it's not just together. It's like a big family, because we take turns, you know, pushing him on that big jogger, and the kids just want to do it. So it's I know that starting young, they're ten, and you know now they want to sign up for sports and all other activities. So it's not just running. You know, they they want to be active. What a great way to keep a family together. I asked today's guest, Dr. Dedia, to explain daytime habits that can disrupt a night of sleep. The concept that is not well understood, better yet not well publicized, is as such. Our daytimes set up our nighttime, and our nighttime sleep sets up the next day. So as much as our daytime can be a hindrance to our night, but it also comes the opportunity. So I always love to say it as such. You know, when I came in through internal medicine, I was very fascinated by nutrition and exercise. Transparently, many of us know what to do, but do we always do it? Mm. So among the things that I would want to do is correlate that as well. So let's get to first what you're asking. What can you and I do during our daytime to set up that wonderful restful night, the restorative sleep? There's many ways to look at it, but let's first start with that of exercise. Move, move, move. Muscle and aerobic work. Back in good old days of biology class, every single little cell, that little energy stuff called ATP, whether we remember it or not, that's not so important. But as you burn up ATP, the A stuff, the adenosine, as it builds up, it induces deeper sleep. So it's important to be significantly physically tired. But wait, overtraining is overdoing something. And when you're in pain, does that help you sleep? Mm -mm. No, it doesn't. So there is that conversation that I want people to be helpful, but don't think more is always better in this case here. But we do know that, again, the adenosine, now, since I brought up adenosine, let me not forget the other correlation here, caffeine. One of the famous things that is a part of our everyday world now. What we'd want to know is, is that caffeine is not evil, but let's talk about where it may not be helpful. It can take some people up to seven hours to reduce their caffeine by 50%. So they've drunk one cup of coffee, seven hours later, they've metabolized only half of that cup. So an 8 a.m. cup of java becomes a half a cup at 3 p.m. And at 10 p.m., it's a quarter cup. Now, a quarter cup might not that be big of a deal, but if it's a pot of coffee in the morning or that afternoon pick-me-up, that might be lingering around. Now, some people might come up to us and say, oh, whatever, I could take an espresso right to bed and I'm out. Adenosine, that chemical that puts us into deeper sleep, gets blocked by caffeine. So why am I so, in particular, about worried about blocking this deep sleep? Deep sleep does something really, really important it helps us put out growth hormone. It puts out proteins that repair the body. So you had a workout, you're feeling a few muscles you haven't felt in a while, you want the full benefit, you want to be able to get that of your deep sleep. So let's not miss that opportunity at all. So it's not growing in height, it's growing our muscles and restoring, repairing. Restore yeah. and repair, we do it every night. Not just when we're sick, but it's a part of the everyday health. And also, during the daytime, yeah. you would want to know the nutrition. What we find is when people eat real food, some of the studies are bearing out you burn more energy. Also, when you're eating real food, it's easier to digest. Gut health becomes overall health. And what we do know is, is that the late night meals, the meals that are highly processed, that are highly fatty, those can sometimes make it difficult to get to sleep and stay asleep. So that's the physical parts that we can do during the daytime. But let's not miss the others. We're not just physical. We're mental, we're emotional as well. So we talk about deep sleep as part of the recovery. There's also this thing called rapid eye movement, dreams. Now the meaning of dreams, I'll excuse myself from <laughs> interpreting them because that's not where I, I know. But there's a part of the brain called the limbic system that gets opened up every night. The limbic system is that where it houses our emotions. The guy who cut you off today, somebody who said thing, something snarky to us, that old thought that now is coming up again, so people tell us, just forget about it. Do we just forget about our stress? No, we don't. And every single night, you get a chance to do emotional clearing. So again, what is the magic of sleep? The magic of sleep is deep sleep, physical repair, dreams, helping you emotionally clear things out. So, so that's why we need to sleep on it, 
Because we actually do that processing in the night. Absolutely. It is so important that we understand this. And therefore, when we are getting less sleep, compared to 100 years ago, compared to our great-grandparents, we're getting 90 minutes less of sleep. That's roughly one sleep cycle. So you might be dropping out some of that dream, but you're definitely dropping out probably some of that deep sleep because you can only have there for so much time to be able to get that sleep. So during the daytime, you gotta move, gotta eat real food. But the other part, if you don't emotionally clear during the daytime, some of that overwhelming thought can be left over. Classically, you'll see somebody anxious or depressed in the middle of night wakening, or the second half of the night, all of a sudden getting their thoughts spinning. That doesn't help anybody sleep. So among the things we want to honor is our daytime, so that our nighttime can really be restorative. Mm, and restore emotions. Wow, I never thought about it. H how important is regularity in our uh, bedtime, our eating time, our sleep? Does yeah. it matter? Absolutely. Now, right, quote unquote, we're creatures of habits. How rude of me to call us creatures. But the conversation is habits, the circadian rhythm, the genetics of the clock. Famously, the most famous clock is the one in our brain. And we know that light really governs this in an amazing way. So what we want to know is, is that when things are more or less set in motion, think of it an amazing machine. One thing begets the next. So what we want to appreciate is that all those systems of the body get a chance to go through their 24-hour system. And we like to do that and let it complete it and then repeat it over and over again. So we keep shifting our clock time. Unfortunately, that can be throwing us off. I mean, this is really well discussed in a lot of the quote-unquote ancient traditions. Traditional Chinese medicine talks about the different organs having their different clock of healing. When I first heard that, I didn't understand that. But when starting to see what modern science is looking at, we're starting to understand some of the traditional wisdom that's been out there for years. So as much as we always look at quantity and quality of sleep, we also want to have regularity of sleep. Before we go to break, did you know that the Bible has quite a bit of advice for getting good quality sleep? Sleep is mentioned in the Bible in many contexts. Two are really relevant for health. The first is found in Ecclesiastes 5, where the wise man says that the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. I think we've all had the experience of falling asleep as soon as our head touches the pillow after a long, hard day of physical work or exercise. That sleep really is sweet we wake up restored. The wise man goes on to add a contrast though. The abundance of the rich will not allow him to sleep. Now that could mean that too much leisure time contributes to insomnia. It can also mean that the more money we have, the more worries and stress we have, which robs us of sleep. The second recommendation for sleep comes from the assurance that God is on your side. In Jeremiah 31, 25, God says, I will fully satisfy the needs of those who are weary and fully refresh the souls of those who are faint. And then they will say, under these circumstances, I can enjoy sweet sleep when I wake up and look around. So why not follow these two biblical principles for sleep? Get vigorous exercise or physical labor every day and make an effort to really believe and know that God is for you and not against you. For a balanced fitness program, strength training is essential. It can slow and prevent a muscle loss that comes with age. And reversing aging is what we're all about. Sean, what are, how are you gonna reverse our aging today? I'm all about reversing the age. And we're gonna do a lower body workout today geared to really challenge some of those big muscles, all right? So if you've got some big weights, grab the big weights. And strength training is about challenging yourself, all right? So keeping the rep count from like eight to 12 is a safe bet, but always thinking about, am I really giving my all to each and every set? Okay. Yeah, could I get, to, could I squeeze another one out? Yes. No, I couldn't. Yes. Sometimes, then, you're, then you're pitching it right. Exactly. Sometimes we go that, with that, do we want to stop or do we need to stop? Right. Sometimes you just gotta like push it. yourself, all right? Yep. So we're gonna, we're gonna start with um, both of our dumbbells. And this is a lower body workout, okay? So I want you to think about 
think about your quads, squeezing your quads, a big group right here in the front, okay? We're gonna work on some balance with this first exercise, working nice. both sides, and then we'll get the, the back side, and then we'll get uh, a little bit more of the entire quad region. So we're gonna start with the split squat, where our back leg is all the way back, our chest is always rolled back, our core is engaged, the weight is to the side, and you are stable. There is no rocking, all right? You are like a, a wall, all right? Nothing is gonna uh, topple you over. Your goal is to bring that back knee down as much as you can with control, come all the way back up, and squeezing that front quad in addition to the back quad, all right? This is working your balance, again, going all the way down and all the way back up. The goal here, and I'll, I'll allow you to continue to go, is for you, again, to work on your balance, all right, work on the quad strength because you sometimes don't realize one side is stronger than the other. This is a great way to pinpoint if you have some imbalances. And once you do that, you can kind of say, I may need to work on this side a little bit more than the next, okay? So that's good, great form. Again, keeping the core nice and tight. Breathe, inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth, and we'll switch legs. So same yeah, otherwise thing. we'll get jealous. Why yep, jealous <laughs> that's <other>? right. <laughs> so a good cue here is if you feel like you're going too low, you can put something uh, like a pillow underneath to kind of as a stopping point. Um, but always keep in mind, you're working on balance. You're working on one side at a time and allowing your body to really be challenged by having the weight on both sides. Yeah, and if, and if you're at a point where you can't even yeah. balance, then okay. you might do it without the weight. Right, Stop. right. Right. and build up. So yep. Can so, of beans. <laughs> can of beans, right? <laughs> You've done those before, right? Yeah. So exercise number two, you, you can again keep eight to 12 per leg. Exercise number two would be your deadlift, all right? Working the hamstring, the back of the quads, okay? So what we're gonna do is keep the weight here on the front of, on our quads and go right forward, all the way down and all the way back up. A good stopping point would be about mid shin to stop all the way down, get a good stretch of your glutes and your hamstring, and come all the way back up, okay? You keep on going, and I'll say, tell you about some things that typically happen. Now, as you're going down, I want you to keep your eyes facing down. Keep the core nice and tight. Sometimes people get into the habit of bending the knee. You don't wanna bend the knee, all right? Number two, you don't wanna lock this too much. So you wanna have a soft knee. Okay. okay? So semi, not locked position, but enough where you can get a good stretch of your hamstring and your glute, all right? Come up nice and strong. This is the deadlift, a great powerful exercise for when you're working out your lower body, mm. all right? Do about three more reps. One, there you go. Two, good contraction. Last one, and three. And number three, the third exercise is called a sumo goblet squat. No, I didn't make up the name, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so the weight is right here in front, core nice and tight, all the way down and all the way up. Okay, this allows you to work your entire quad, putting everything that we just did in the last two exercises together. Again, your sumo, all right, goblet, squat, feet nice and wide, my toes are intentionally pointing out, core nice and tight, and you were holding on to those weights for dear life, all right? <laughs> but working as hard as you can. Yeah. Right. Three cool. awesome exercises that you can do to work your upper, your lower body, challenge yourself, burn tons of calories, and have a great time. Awesome. All right, let's stretch it out. Okay. Let's take one side since you're working on balance. You can hold on to a chair, all right? Three, two, one. Relax, get the other side. Hold it for three. That feels so two, good. It does. And one, and you are done. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. You're welcome. A vegetarian diet can improve your waist loss. Can it improve your mood and make you happier? A study of 138 Adventists found that the answer is yes. The individuals following a vegetarian diet had more than 50% less depression and anxiety than the non-vegetarians. And when asked about their general moods, the vegetarians were happier. Less than 1% had mood changes that left them unhappy. Their diet made a difference. A vegetarian diet is linked to happiness and is another ageless advantage. It's question time. Here's our first question. Glenda asks, I use olive oil for veggies, salads, and cold dishes. What's the healthiest oil for sauteing and frying? Well, 
the healthiest oil, I think, is, is one that can withstand the heat. Um, so you need one that's going to be heat tolerant. Uh, you can stick with just olive oil. If you're just doing a moderate heat, it will stand moderate heat. But if you're using a high heat, for example, you're baking or you're frying at high temperature, you're best to use an oil that's got a high smoke point, like canola oil, which has a good omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Now, one caveat is that most canola is genetically engineered, so you want to consider buying organic for that. Here's the next question. Susan says, does drinking charcoal mixed in water help get rid of, the, get rid of toxins or only from the GI tract? Well, charcoal can help to detoxify the whole body because the GI tract is actually a major organ of excretion and it already is a detoxifying um, organ for the whole body. And it will, uh, you know, the GI tract also includes the liver, which is a major detox organ, as well as the intestines. So yeah, go for it. Last question. Sarah asks, since the amount of food is a concern for um, gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, how much food should an eight-year-old have? Well, it depends on how active they are. That will be a guide to how many calories they need. But you're probably looking at about 1,700 calories because they're also growing. Um, if they're heavy for their age and height, it may be that they're eating too much. So also be guided by their weight, what their weight is doing. And remember, excess food before lying down at night makes skirt more likely, so it depends when they're eating. So trying to make breakfast the larger meal and supper the smaller meal. Well, thanks for those questions. Remember, you can leave your question on our phone, by text, on the website, or at Facebook. Always love to hear from you. Now let's go shopping. Corn is the most widely grown crop in the Americas where it originated. When fresh, it's a vegetable, but when it's dried, it's a grain. Unfortunately, most of the corn grown in the US and Canada is fed to animals, making it our number one field crop. And then it's used industrially to make things like ethanol, cosmetics, ink, glue, laundry starch, medicines, and fabrics. There are many different types of corn. Sweet corn is the traditional summertime treat with its high sugar content, and that's primarily used for human consumption. Dent corn or field corn is fed to livestock and it's used for industrial purposes. Flint corn is the decorative Indian corn that comes in a range of pretty colours. And a sub-variety of flint corn is also used to make popcorn, which is what I've got here. Most of the corn in America is genetically engineered, with the exception of flint corn. Corn is high in vitamin A, antioxidants and carotenoids, especially those associated with eye health like lutein and zeaxanthin. Traditionally, corn's eaten with beans, and since the two have complementary proteins, that works really well to provide a meal complete in protein. In Central and South America, corn is often nixtamalized for better health. That involves soaking it in an alkaline solution like lime water, and then after draining, it's turned into masa flour. That process makes the B vitamins highly bioavailable, and it also adds some calcium. Whichever way you enjoy your corn, bon appetit. Dr. Paramdidi is a sleep physician. I asked him what signs we should look for to tell if our sleep is not what it should be. So this is where I have to say we're still maturing in medicine. Sometimes you and I know if we didn't get enough sleep. Sometimes we don't. Isn't that rude of me to tell somebody you don't even know that you're sleepy? Now, there's a lot of questions, uh, questionnaires that are out there. And let me give you just a few that I throw out when I talk to people or I give them an idea. I often say the following are not normal. It's not normal to fall asleep in the middle of reading a boring book. It's not normal to fall asleep at a boring meeting or one of my boring lectures. Not normal to fall asleep on an airplane. I'm not talking about red-eye flights. It's not normal to fall asleep when you're a passenger in a car for an hour without a break. It's not normal to fall asleep at stoplights or at stop signs. Many people are like, what? Well, that's ridiculous. That's more common than any of us want to know. In Canada and the United States, they've been tracking this over and now over a decade. Some years, alcohol, yes, creating fatalities behind the wheel, but some years, sleepiness, sleep deprivation, creating more fatalities. If you, I came into a meeting of yours drunk, you might say, what's going on, you, compassionately? Somebody comes to one of our meetings sleepy, what do we do? Give them caffeine, tell them to get some fresh air, 
In other words, it's impairment, but we don't see it as impairment. And we definitely don't want to miss that conversation. I'm not trying to belittle all calls effect on that of driving, but I'm wishing to promote the conversation that sleepiness also is an impairment. Absolutely. I, I, I know from being working long hours at the hospital, I can come out and drive like a drunk. And it's scary. And therefore, some of us know it and some of us don't. And the future of medicine will be giving a much better understanding of what it is to get enough. But always, first and foremost, giving people permission to get their seven to nine hours and see how they feel. You know, the godfather of sleep, as many of us call him, Dr. William DeMent of Stanford, who did sleep before it was a cool field. I said, oh, you know, I tried it over a weekend. When I was young in the field, I went and saw him at a seminar. He goes, a weekend, huh? He goes, do it for 10 to 14 days, and then come talk to me. Because one of the conversations is, again, like habits, our body needs to acclimate to things. So if somebody were to be listening to this conversation, oh, I tried it, it really didn't do me much benefit, one night is not going to give you everything you're looking for. It may or may not be helpful, but definitely 10, 14 days into it, you're more likely to start getting a whiff test. Is it really something you want to look at? Or 10 to 14 nights. <laughs> yes, thank you. Love that. <laughs> now, sleep disorders present in different ways, don't they? Yes, yes. You know, there's so many ways to look at it. You know, among the most famous uh, things to think about, sleep apnea. But then that's not the only one. But first of all, there's a lot of confusion about apnea. A lot of people say, I don't snore. I don't have that. Indeed, what is apnea? A means without, P means air. There's a collapse of the airway, and there's a partial collapse. Apnea, A means without, P means air. It's a full collapse for 10 seconds or more. So it's that famous person who snores, snores, 10 seconds of no air. And what does that guy in the plane do next to us? <laughs> right? We all sat next to that guy, unfortunately. That poor that guy. We got to help him. But let me share it. Some people have a partial collapse of the airway. They may or may not hear it. So in other words, that's not that dramatic. It's not going to win any awards or wake up or shake the bed partner. So that's the obstructive part. There's another type of apnea called the central sleep apnea, where the brain forgets to take a breath. Classically congestive heart failure, classically in terms of some of the narcotic kind of medications, you know, other kind of disorders. But it's rare, but we don't ever want to miss it. Another one that we never want to miss is the, what we formerly called restless leg syndrome. Now, they're getting rid of that term because it's not only the legs. It can be the arms. It can be the torso. It's now called willis Eckbaum syndrome. Oh, my. Named after Dr. Willis and Eckbaum, who wrote about it. Unfortunately, people are not remembering that, so I think we're always going to be you know, looking at it, at least for the next, I shouldn't say always, but for the next several years, we'll be looking at it as restless. But here's the part that confuses people. Night to night, it can vary. So one night, it can be obnoxious, and another night, frankly, not notable. And people then sometimes say, oh, I'm not kicking. I'm not thrashing. Those are the rare. But more commonly, somebody might be rubbing their feet, fanning out their toes, needing to stretch, feel a creepy crawly, feeling a heaviness and ache, or that person. They get into bed every night. Nope, not the right position. Nope, not a, oh gosh, they've gotten the pillows, they've got the mattress, and every night's still an event to get into sleep. Mm -hmm. And why I like to bring this up is any sleep disorders, whether it be pain, medications, or some of the things we do like caffeine, alcohol, um, or medical disorders, when you break up sleep, we call it fragmented sleep. We have a fun statement in sleep medicine to help explain this. Fragmented sleep makes you feel as if you've not slept at all. Right. I would never do this, but say I snuck into a bedroom and I took a feather and I wafted on somebody's face, maybe in their nostril, in their ear, whatever, right? Some kind of unfavorable trick in the middle of the night. But I had somebody swat my, their hands away, swat my feather away with their hands, but didn't really wake them up. And I did that several times an hour. How great will they feel in the morning? Oh, they'll feel rubbish. So therefore, some of us therefore have some of this stuff going on, and we don't know it. And it sl happens slowly over time. So sometimes you're like, ouch, I'm not sleeping well. But other times, like, yeah, it is what it is. I'm not doing well until we get to that tipping point. So a lot of times, I'm doing things to pull on that person to learn about their medical history. I want to know about their depression and anxiety. That can be making their sleep disordered, or vice versa. I want to know about their cardiovascular history. I want to know. Are they needing more and more blood pressure medicines? Two or more blood pressure medicines without an obvious source? I want to look at sleep apnea. Or, again, the restlessness. I want to take a look also at that person related to seeing if they have atrial fibrillation. 
It's been said now, of all people with atrial fibrillation, half of them have sleep apnea. And if untreated, more cardioversion or more drugs to keep it in rhythm. So the opportunity to look at sleep is not subtle. It is where sleep begets medicine, medicine begets out of our sleep. We need to look at health and healing and sleep all in one. We'll talk with Dr. Param about cures for insomnia in the last segment, so stick around. Sergio and his wife are the parents of 10-year-old triplets, two boys and a girl. One son, Gabriel, has cerebral palsy, but that didn't stop them engaging in family sports. They joined a non-profit called Athletes Serving Athletes, an organisation that enabled disabled people to compete in sporting events. In addition, Sergio competes in Ironman triathlon events, all on his own. Watch. We don't do it to win prizes, obviously. I mean, I don't do it to win my age screw up, nothing like that. Trust me, I'm like one of the last one or the last one crossing the finish line. But it's about, you know, our motto for Athletes Serving Athletes, together we finish. So we do it as a group. You know, we start together, we finish together. And because an athlete, obviously, he can do it by himself, but they feel they're, they're part of it. Like my son, I mean, he's 10, you know, the triplets, and he's disabled, but you should see the smile that he carries on. I mean, when he's a race day, he knows it's a race day, and he wants to do it. I mean, when you train for an Ironman, once you get towards three, four months in, you literally, the weekends, all you do is train. Because on, Friday, on Saturday, you'll do your long bike rides. You're talking about 100-mile bike rides every Saturday. So that means you're away from home, you know, seven, eight hours. And then you got to come home, eat, rest, and then in the morning you got to do your long runs between, you know, you start 12, 13, all the way up to 20 miles on Sunday. So it takes a lot. So that's why it's finding, easy, you don't have to do all those crazy things to be healthy. You know, I think it's even maybe it's not even that healthy because now you're putting a lot of pound into your body and you know, I've done those warrior dash, kind of like those the obstacle course run. That wasn't for me. I'm still a big guy. I can't climb those rocks and, <laughs> you know, you get yourself hurt. The most rewarding ones is when I do it with my kid. And, you know, like I said, like last Sunday, my wife and I are doing together, helping my son get through that finish line is, you know, we were the last one out there, but it doesn't matter. I mean, we still did it. I mean, we covered the same course as everybody else did. Between my fam, my wife and my kids, I mean, we have more medals than you can <laughs> imagine. I mean, it's just, that's our little reward for ourselves. So you do it, yeah, you know, you do it for the medal and the shirt, you know, but, you know, at the end of the way, the reward is everyone happy. You know. That's such a lovely goal, a happy family. Today we're talking with sleep specialist, Dr. Param Didia. I asked him about insomnia and how to tackle it. So insomnia, right, troubles getting to sleep, staying asleep, and waking up and living the life you want to be a part of. Chronic insomnia famously is that three times a week going on for at least three weeks or more. But you're right, any insomnia is what it's looked at. And it's like the pain of sleep. It's not really well you know, measured. How do you measure somebody's insomnia? But let me share with you one of the things in the world that you and I are living in. I want us to talk about rituals. It is so important that we honor that time before bed. We go from these amazing daytimes and all of a sudden we're full physically, mentally, and emotionally with all these beautiful things and we got to drop right into sleep. So also, as an internist, let me talk about a topic that would be a bit odd for me perhaps, but it's not, sensuality. Our five senses make us human and that's a lovely way to help us entrain ourselves, to cue ourselves, to nudge us toward that of never, never land. So let's talk about what can you and I do. Again, the daytime stuff, move, eat real food, emotionally clear. But now come that night, here it is, dim the lights. Light wakes up the brain quicker than any other. What color light now famously is out there that wakes us up? Blue light. Where do you and I find blue light? Screens, mm. any screen. And what we know now is, know now is that yeah, a lot of the screens can be now having these different type of apps that are gonna turn down the blue it makes them look orangish or yellow. But you can also find goggles or covers that go over existing things that don't have that technology that cuts out the blue light. But what we also want to appreciate, any light can be uh, more or less aggravating in awakening the brain. Light's great in the morning, it wakes you up, but at nighttime it's not your friend. 
So when it's getting darker outside, make it darker inside. Next thing, cool, comfortable, dark, and quiet. So in addition to the dark, I really want to emphasize dark. Black out the shades, get those black out shades. Some people can tolerate what's sitting on their face, the eye mask. Some people hate them, some people love them. Know thyself, but less light is important. But say you want to go up to the washroom, to the loo in the middle of the night. You don't want to fall and hit your head. So what color light might you put in there that's least alerting? The spectrum of yellow, orange, and red tends to be least alerting. So if you need to put something up for safety, safety always. Also what I want you to know, appreciate is, again, those five senses, smells. Lavender is famous. Some people love lavender and other people tell me that they just cannot tolerate lavender. We all have our individual experiences. One person likes orange, one person likes grape. I'm not here to tell somebody they're right or they're wrong. But I want people to have fun with this. Essential oils, candles. But here's yet another one. I love people to consider this. Take a warm shower bath before bed. When you do that, you are warming up your body, but the core warms up. But as soon as you step out, the air, the ambient air, cools the core. Not shivering, cools the core. That sets up the chemical that puts us into deeper sleep. So among the things that I love for people to consider is when you get into a shower, what can you do? Wonderful smelling salts or bath salts or gels. You can maybe put on some dim light or put on some candles. It's a time where you're not likely to be in front of a screen, right? You're not going to be texting or emailing no, or something like that. They get wet, right. Yes. <laughs> now, the last part that I always want people to appreciate what they can be doing from the lifestyle conversation is create schedules. Our bodies love that. So I have more or less that conversation in terms of a more or less a wind down time. You can't really force yourself to go to sleep, but you can set up a wake up time maybe with some discomfort on certain mornings here and there. But if you hold that steady, you're more likely to keep the cue. So make your, your wake-up time the fixed point. Yes. And, and yeah. Timing the caffeine and alcohol, but let me not forget the ritual. A lot of people say, oh, I have a beautiful ritual. I take a bottle of wine and I split it with my beloved before bed, or I just have a half a bottle of wine before bed. So what do we know? There's some great research on alcohol, but we're still learning what it does in the brain. For every one drink you have, it takes two hours to wash through the body, so it doesn't affect sleep. The first hour, you're more relaxed, but your airway is more. Our bed partners might snore a little more if they've had a nightcap. Mm -hmm. You might be inducing a form of sleep-related breathing, such as apnea. The second hour, the brain is fidgety. Therefore, you might get to sleep, but you're not staying asleep. Alcohol is around the world, and a choice that people think is helpful, but it's not. And unfortunately, some people become dependent on it and that can really dysregulate some of their sleep. So the last thing though, the busy brain. People have done this and they got the busy brain. And people say, oh, it's easy, just think of nothing. I have no idea what that personally means. Some yogi or yogini can explain it to me someday, but I personally don't have it. But so what I wish to say is focus the brain. In my opinion, the brain's a factory. It makes thoughts. Let's focus that thought onto a point. Let's recite, if it soothes, poem, prayer, hymn if it suits. Count your breaths. Visualize it and feel it. If you get to 10, fantastic. Then start over. Others, they'll do more or less a body scan or screen or progressive relaxation. The famous one, the Reynolds technique, start in that of the toes. Tighten up the toes, tight, tight, tight. Relax. Calf muscles, tight, tight, tight. Relax. Keep going through the body's muscles. Now, invariably, you're going to think of something. And curl up a smile, we're all human, and just start over. Because the concept is, is as we keep slowing down the mind, it's going to make it easier. If we're trying to be perfect ab about this, it doesn't help at all. So what I really wish for us to appreciate is create that ritual. But the last point, after 20 minutes, if you're still awake, get out of bed. Most people, more or less, will sit there, and you always want bed to be about two things. Sleep and intimacy, and that's it. So therefore, a lot of people get up and get on the computer, TVs, that kind of stuff. We don't want it. Go back to one of the relaxation techniques that got you to sleep, but that also can be that which helps you get back to sleep. And when you're sufficiently tired, then get back in bed and honor the opportunities for yourself. As you honor that, you honor your sleep and honor the day that you want to be a part of. It's so true that we have to honor our sleep if we want optimal health. And just as the Bible says, the day really does begin in the evening when we rest and sleep, charging up for when the sun comes up. 
Exercising in bright outdoor light sets us up to sleep well later, but eating late disrupts sleep, as does caffeine and alcohol. So decide what your evening ritual will look like. Will it include turning screens off, setting the lights down low, stepping into a dark, calm, quiet bedroom and climbing into a comfortable bed after saying your evening prayers? If so, you're well on the way to mastering the art of good sleep. That's all from me today. Thanks for joining us on Go Healthy For Good. I'll see you next time.